Hey everyone, this is Ryan, and in this video, we're going to be talking about an introduction to basic dental terminology. And so whether you're going into the dental workforce or just interested and in maybe pursuing dentistry, this video will give you an idea about some of the basic dental terms used by dentists and dental professionals every day. So first, I want to introduce this diagram. It's incredibly important, and you'll probably see something like it hanging up in a dental office. So this picture from 3D Science helps us get oriented a little bit. So we're basically looking at our patient in the dental chair with their mouth wide open, and their right side is on the left side of this image, and their left side is on the right side of this image, which does make things very confusing at first. So right is on the left, and left is on the right, and I promise you'll get the hang of it. And imagine this mouth stretching as far open as possible, and you'll get something like this image on the right. Now, this collection of teeth, the upper teeth, are connected to the maxilla, or the upper jaw bone, so we call this the maxillary arch, whereas the lower teeth are connected to the lower jawbone, which is called the mandible, and so this collection of teeth is referred to as the mandibular arch. So we have mandibular, and we have maxillary on the top. Now for types of teeth, um, and they're oriented by their location, their shape, and their function. So the incisors refer to the front four teeth right here. And this is the same for both the maxillary arch and the mandibular arch. And the incisors are used for incising or slicing uh, food. They're, of course, important for aesthetics because they're in the front. And they're important for phonetics, like if you're pronouncing F and V sounds, you'll notice that your incisors contact your lower lip. Now the canines refer to these teeth right next door to the incisors. And the canines are important for tearing and holding food, and also important for aesthetics. Now both the incisors and the canines together ref are referred to as the anterior teeth because they're in the front and they're the most visible of all of our teeth. Now the premolars are the next two teeth back from the canines. And the premolars are useful for also tearing and holding food as well as grinding food. And finally, the back three teeth are referred to as the molars, the first, second, and third molars. And the third molars are uh, usually referred to as the wisdom teeth. And so the premolars and molars combined are referred to as the posterior teeth because they're located in the back. So again, we have the incisors, the canines, the first and second premolars, and the first, second, and third molars. And this is the same layout as for the mandibular arch. So how about for numbering teeth? Uh, numbering teeth and counting teeth can be a actually a little bit complicated at first. It, it gets a little bit disorienting, but it is super important uh, in the dental field because as dental professionals communicate, it's important to know which teeth we're trying to talk about. So I'll talk about the universal notation system. There are a couple that are out there, but the universal system probably most universally used. And uh, it's basically like you're reading a book. You start in the upper left corner and you move to the right. So we're going to start at the upper left corner, which will be the third, the upper right third molar. Remember, let me write that in here. If we're talking about the left side of the image, that's actually the patient's right. 
and the right side of the image is the patient's left, like we saw in that diagram before. So we're going to start here, and this first tooth will be number one, followed by number two, three, and so on. Once we get to this central incisor, these are eight and nine, and I'll skip to here. We have 14, 15, and 16. And so there are 16 teeth in the adult dentition on top, and there are also 16 on the bottom. So what we're going to do is now that we got to 16, we continue right here to form a nice clockwise circle. So we'll keep going 17, 18, 19, and I'll just skip ahead over to here, 30, 31, and 32. So 32 teeth in total. Now, of course, um, some people like myself aren't born and never develop any wisdom teeth. So um, if you are missing, say, this tooth and this tooth, you just skip those numbers, and this would still be number two and number three and so on. You just wouldn't include um, these numbers. They would just be called congenitally missing teeth. Congenitally missing. All right. So that's the basics of the number system. There are other numbering systems out there, but just for uh, the sake of this video, we'll stick with the universal system. So we have uh, the permanent dentition is what we've been talking about thus far. We also have the primary dentition. So the primary dentition basically refers to uh, the baby teeth or the primary teeth. And this would be um, starting around six months, typically, is when you'll start getting these uh, teeth to erupt, usually starting with the lower incisors. And so the baby teeth will come in one at a time, you'll get a couple, a couple more, and then you'll finally get a full set of primary dentition. Now, when it's maybe about, and of course there's some variation here, when you get to about six years, you'll start to have eruption of the permanent dentition, again, usually starting with the lower incisors. And when I talk about eruption, I'm talking about the teeth that are coming into the mouth. So eruption is coming in, and exfoliation means that the teeth are being shed, they're coming out of the mouth. So as the permanent teeth erupt, the primary teeth that are being replaced will be exfoliated. So that's a helpful way to think about those terms. So again, six months, we're starting to get eruption of the primary teeth. By six years, we're starting to get eruption of the permanent teeth. And it takes about till 12 years for the last baby teeth to be exfoliated and to be completely replaced by permanent teeth. This transition period from about six years to about 12 years old is called the mixed dentition. When we have a mix of both primary teeth and permanent teeth, so it's sort of the transformative years from this full dentition until we get about this, um, we only get permanent teeth. And of course, it takes a little bit longer for the third molars to come in. Um, it could be even when you're 18, 19, 20, they could be coming in uh, as late as that. So primary dentition and the permanent dentition. So now let's talk about directional terms. I think it's helpful to think about like a dice or a cube that has six surfaces. A tooth is sort of similar, except we don't count the bottom surface. So you can think of there being one, two, three, four, and then five surfaces that we want to consider when we're talking about um, the directional terms for a tooth. So the outer surface, the surface that points out towards the face, so I'll just 
draw a couple arrows here. So this surface here, this surface here, this surface here. These are called the facial surfaces. So the facial surface, we can just, um, for short, we'll say F for facial. And now if we talk about the back side, the side that is closest to the tongue, so this surface here, this surface here, and the same for the lower, this surface here. These are all called the lingual surfaces. So L for lingual, which makes sense because lingua meaning tongue. Now let me draw in um, an imaginary line. Oops, I can do a better job than that. Right through here, and then again right through here. So this line bisecting the right and left sides, which I'll draw in one more time here, is called a midline. And so everything on the right side, of course, is the right side of the mouth, and the left side is the left side of the mouth. And again, it's flipped from what we see here on this image, and that's because we're looking at the patient with their mouth wide open. So the midline is important because for the next two surfaces I'll talk about, you have to think in terms of orientation to the midline. So for this tooth number here, and this is number one, two, three, four, five, six, this surface right here that I'm going to highlight is facing towards the midline, whereas the, this surface here would be facing away. So the surface facing towards the midline is called the mesial surface. So M for mesial. Whereas the side pointed away from the midline is called the distal surface. So mesial and distal are incredibly important terms to know as well as facial and lingual. So that covers uh, about four of them. So we have one more to talk about, and that's going to be this surface right here. And this surface right here. It's essentially the surface that you're biting and chewing with. And so that surface will be called the occlusal, or O for occlusal surface. Now there are a couple of little, so that's basically the, the five um, tooth surfaces, but it gets a little bit more intricate if we want to uh, compare the anterior teeth with the posterior teeth. So what do I mean by that? The anterior teeth, again, are the incisors plus the canines. So these six right here. Now the facial surface I already talked about would be referring to the, the surface that is pointed outwards towards the face. But if we're talking about an anterior tooth specifically, we can still call it a facial surface or we can call it a, the labial surface. And that's because it's um, up against the inside of the lips. So the same thing could be said for this. So it's just another way to talk about the facial surface but more specifically for anterior teeth. Now, the posterior teeth, the facial surfaces of those teeth, also have a special name, and they are called the buccal surface, or B for short. And that's because they are um, contacting the inside of the cheek, and the cheek um, is often has this root associated with it, like the buccinator muscle or the buccal surface. So that's because these posterior teeth are contacting the inside of the cheek. So that's a way to um, distinguish between the facial surfaces of the posterior teeth and the facial surface of an anterior tooth. All right, so we have our five surfaces. Again, in blue, we have all our facial surfaces. In red, we have our lingual surfaces. 
we have our mesial and distal, and we have our occlusal surfaces. And for occlusal, again, we can distinguish between a posterior tooth, which would just be, again, called the occlusal surface, where we're chewing and biting on using these teeth to grind our food. For the anterior teeth, occlusal would be technically correct, but we tend to use incisal instead. And um, it makes sense for the incisors, but you may be asking, what about the canines? They're also um, referred to as the incisal surface because they're, uh, they have one cusp that is biting and, and slicing into food. So incisal surface is, tends to be um, more precise. So that is our, those are our five surfaces that I want to cover. Um, so let's keep on moving. For the next part, we'll talk about parts of the tooth. So now we're talking about the anatomy of a tooth specifically. What, what uh, layers and uh, things like that compose the teeth? So this picture is from the National Institute of Health, and it nicely uh, sort of simply lays this stuff out. So the enamel refers to the outermost layer of the tooth. You may have heard it being talked about as the hardest tissue in the human body, which is true. Um, so it's ha very hard, calcium-rich surface that protects our teeth. Um, it's 96% mineral by weight, so it's very dense and very, very strong. The substance underneath it is called dentin, and that's this orangish layer here, and it's a little bit softer. And that's because it's about 70% mineral by weight. Now the pulp is this red pinkish material at the very core of the tooth, and this is the soft tissue inside the tooth that contains blood vessels and nerves, basically the life support, the life supply of each tooth. And um, each pulp consists of specific parts. You have the pulp chamber up here, so that's basically this portion here. You have pulp horns, which are these parts that sort of stick up from the pulp chamber, and you have pulp or root canals, which refer to these portions. And they're um, often confused with root canal treatment, but everybody has root canals in their teeth, um, but not necessarily root canal treatment, which is done if you have very deep decay or trauma that uh, damages this root system and you need to clean it all out. So there is a distinction between having a root canal anatomically and a root canal treatment. And then next we have um, the gums, which are these uh, darker and lighter pink structures here that surround a tooth. And we have the bone, which is um, actually a tiny bit softer than dentin. It's about 65% mineral. And so this would be, as we talked about before, that we had the maxilla, the upper jaw bone, and the mandible, the lower jaw bone that encases these teeth in place. And I want to just quickly mention that the gums are sometimes also referred to as the gingiva. So sometimes I will call it that instead of, instead of the gum tissue. So those are synonymous. Now not shown here, but I want to highlight is a thin layer that starts right below the enamel. So we have this white enamel layer, and then right here on the outside of the tooth, we have, it's kind of hard to see, I picked a bad color, I guess, is this thin orange layer that I'm drawing in. That outermost layer of the tooth below the enamel is called the cementum. Cementum. And the cementum 
is a thin, hard tissue that covers the root of a tooth. And it is 65, about 65% mineral, which is similar to bone. Now, another structure I want to point out that's not labeled here is this light pink that runs all through here and here and all the way up through here. And it's almost, you know, continuous with the gingiva, like in this in this diagram. This structure here that connects the tooth root to the bone is called the periodontal ligament, which I'll just, for short, we'll say PDL. Now ligaments usually connect bone to bone, like the, you know, the ACL that you hear a lot about in sports, but here the ligament is connecting a tooth which is not technically a bone, and the bone of the jaw. So that about covers most of it. We have the enamel, dentin, and pulp layers of the tooth, and we have the gums and the bone that support it, as well as the PDL that connects it to the bone, holds it in place, and the cementum layer of the root. Now I do want to mention one other kind of technical structure, but it's super important in dentistry, and that is the junction between the cementum and the enamel. And it's conveniently called the cemento-enamel junction, or I'll just say CEJ for short. So the CEJ is a very important structure of the tooth. It's a very anatomically reliable structure and landmark for us to use. If I draw a dotted line that symbolizes the CEJ, the junction between the cementum and the enamel, anything above the CEJ, so let me get this color here, anything above the CEJ is referred to as the anatomic crown of the tooth. Whereas anything below the CEJ is referred to as the anatomic root. So you might be wondering, why am I saying anatomic? Well, in some cases, the, the gum tissue recedes a lot and will expose more of the tooth above the gum. So the, if the gums you know, receded to a level like here, we would call everything above that um, recession line the clinical crown and anything below that the clinical root. So it's a little bit um, confusing, but that's just a, a way to um, define structures in terms of uh, anatomics because the CEJ will stay constant or what you see clinically, anything above that sticks above the gums would be called the clinical crown and anything that anchors the tooth in the jaw that you don't see covered by bones and gums would be the clinical root and it just turns out in this picture in an ideal situation the anatomic and clinical crown are the same and the anatomic and clinical root are the same but again i can cover this more in another video and one other structure before I move on is just the tip of the root is called the apex. And that's important because um, if we talk about, if we go back to directional terms, if we talk about something that's located in this direction, we would call it the apical direction because it's towards the apex. Or as if we were moving in this direction, we would call it coronal, or towards the top of the crown. All right. Sorry, I know that was a lot, but this is um, hopefully some really useful information for you guys. So now let's talk a little bit about um, disease processes that can happen to the teeth. So tooth decay is the first one we want to talk about. 
and that refers to um, the uh, the loss of mineral structure due to um, bacteria and the bacterial products. And um, this is due to, uh, could be a lot of different things, but usually um, the cause is plaque, which is a collection of bacteria on the tooth surface. And then our second disease process involving teeth is um, called gum disease. And this also involves plaque, the collection of bacteria on a tooth surface, which you can see clearly here. It's this kind of icky um, collection of bacteria, also sometimes called uh, biofilm. And this biofilm, if it accumulates on the tooth, it's not cleaned off um, frequently or efficiently, then it can cause inflammation. So this inflamed gum tissue, it becomes red, swollen, and painful, and it bleeds a lot. And so that's what happens if you don't floss your teeth regularly and clean well around the gum tissue. And so this picture is a classic representation of gingivitis, or inflammation of the gums. And I called them gingiva before, and that's where they get, um, has to do with the gingivitis, is the same root of the word. And then if this plaque stays around even longer, a more severe infection of the gums occurs as the gingivitis gets worse. And it can cause not only gingival inflammation, but the gums and bone that support the tooth can retreat and recede away from the plaque. When it's severe and long-standing enough, the teeth can even loosen and fall out. And this disease process, a more severe gingivitis, is called periodontitis. And it's so named because itis, again for inflammation, and peri around the tooth. So it's inflammation of the periodontium, which is the tissue around the tooth supporting it in place. So again, this is a more severe disease process, and the way to distinguish periodontitis from gingivitis is periodontitis involves bone loss, whereas gingivitis does not. So periodontitis is an irreversible process because unless we're doing a graft or something like that, bone is, is very difficult to reform. And finally, I want to finish up this video going through a glossary of some dental terms. We already talked about a bunch, but dentists use a lot of words to describe parts of the mouth and certain problems and procedures. And I just wanted to include some more in alphabetical order. This is from the Glossary of Dental, Clinical, and Administrative Terms published by the ADA. So abrasion refers to wear on a tooth caused by brushing too hard, holding things in your teeth, like the end of a pencil, uh, and other rubbing actions, like using a very abrasive toothpaste. Amalgam refers to a dental filling material made up of a mixture of different metals, such as mercury, silver, tin, and copper, also known as a silver filling. A band uh, is, refers to a metal ring put around a tooth, with cement as part of orthodontic treatment. A bicuspid is also called, it's another name for a premolar. And that's because, um, sorry about that, but it's, uh, it's called a bicuspid because it refers to the premolar having two cusps or pointed areas on top and the premolars, as we talk about, are located in front of the molars. A bite wing refers to an x-ray um, that's commonly used in dentistry. Um, it's probably the most common type of x-ray taken at a routine exam, and um, it takes a picture of the crowns of both the upper and the lower molars and premolars. Bonding refers to the process by which a tooth-colored filling material or 
orthodontic brackets are attached to a tooth. And a bridge is an appliance that is cemented in place and replaces a missing tooth. It attaches it to a artificial tooth, uh, an artificial tooth or teeth to the natural teeth next to it. So if we had a natural tooth here, we were missing one, natural tooth here, a bridge, like the word suggests, bridges these two natural teeth together, connected by a fake tooth in the center to restore that spot. Bruxism refers to an unconscious habit of grinding or clenching the teeth, which often happens when a person is sleeping or during the day if it's related to stress. Calculus is another name for tartar, which is a hard deposit of minerals coated with bacterial plaque that can build up on the teeth and cause gums to get inflamed like we talked about before. It's basically mineralized dental plaque. It's scraped off when a dentist cleans your teeth or a hygienist cleans your teeth during a routine cleaning. Composite refers to a tooth colored filling material used to repair or cosmetically enhance teeth that's made up of several types of resin-based substances. A crown can refer to the top part of the natural tooth that's covered with enamel, like we talked about before, but also the name for a restoration that covers the entire natural crown when the tooth has broken down and can't be fixed by a smaller amalgam or a composite filling. A cusp refers to one of the pointed parts on the top of a tooth. Dry socket refers to a process of pain and inflammation in a tooth socket uh, following a tooth being removed and the blood clot is lost, leaving the bone and nerve ending exposed, which again is, is very painful. An endodontist refers to one of the nine ADA recognized specialties and it's a specialist who treats problems of the tooth nerve or pulp or infections in the bone associated with infected nerves with procedures such as a root canal treatment. Erosion is the process of losing or wearing of dental hard tissue by acids not caused by bacteria. An extraction is another name for the removal of all or part of a tooth. An impacted tooth is a tooth that's blocked from coming out through the gums by another tooth, bone, or soft tissue. An implant is a device that's put into the jawbone to replace a missing tooth and or hold a prosthesis such as a crown or bridge or even anchor a denture in place. Malocclusion is when the upper and lower teeth aren't lined up well in order to bite and chew properly. A mouth guard is a removable device that a person wears over their teeth to protect them from damage during sports like basketball. And a night guard is similar. It's also a removable device that a person wears over their teeth, but at night to protect them from damage due to bruxism, like we mentioned before. Now, occlusion, like malocclusion, talks about the contact between the upper and lower teeth, but this is just in more general terms, talking about how they contact together in order to bite and chew. An orthodontist is another ADA specialty as a type of dentist that works to correct the position of teeth with braces and other instruments. The palate refers to the hard and soft tissues that form the roof of the mouth. A pediatric dentist is also a dentist who specializes in treating children. A periodontal pocket is a deep area between a tooth and the gums. That's the result of gum disease, like we mentioned before. And a periodontist is a dentist who specializes in treating the periodontal tissues that surround the teeth, like the gums and the bone and the periodontal ligament. Plaque is a sticky film of bacteria and other substances that coat the teeth every day. Brushing and flossing help remove plaque, and if not removed regularly, plaque can lead to 
the things we talked about before, like tooth decay and gum disease. A prosthesis is an artificial replacement of a tooth or teeth, or even missing soft and hard tissues. A restoration is a kind of treatment that repairs or replaces teeth, also called a filling. A retainer is a removable device that's worn in the mouth to prevent teeth from moving out of position, often used after orthodontic treatment or premature loss of teeth to hold open spaces. And again, a root canal treatment is a type of treatment that removes the tooth, nerve, or pulp and seals that space formerly occupied by the nerve with some inert material. A crown is usually recommended, especially uh, for posterior teeth, to cover the tooth to prevent it from breaking after this treatment. And finally, um, we have a couple more terms here. Uh, scaling and root planing refers to a procedure that uses tools to remove plaque, tartar, and stains from teeth. A sealant is a thin plastic resin coating that can be placed on the biting surfaces of back teeth to help prevent cavities. Sublingual refers to under the tongue, and that's from sub and lingual. Uh, TMJ is short for the temporomandibular joint. And that's the joint that connects the lower jaw to the skull. And this is not to be confused with TMD, which refers to temporomandibular joint dysfunction, which is pain, clicking, and other symptoms that are caused by problems with the TMJ and associated muscles. A veneer is a thin artificial cover for a tooth to correct its shape or color. It's made to look and feel like a real tooth, and veneers can be made of porcelain, ceramic, composite, or acrylic resin. And finally, um, sorry it's cut off a little bit, but xerostomia refers to dry mouth caused by salivary glands that don't work properly or reduced flow of saliva from medications. And that's all I have for this video. I know it was a lot, but hopefully it gives you an idea about some of the basic dental terminology used by dentists and dental professionals every day. Thanks so much for watching, guys. Please leave a like and subscribe to my channel if you haven't already. And again, thanks for watching, and I'll see you guys next time.